Just sit right back and you'll hear a tale, a tale of a fateful trip. It started from a tropic port aboard this tiny ship. The mate, the mate, you know the mate. The mate was a mighty sailing man, the skipper brave and sure. Five passengers set sail that day for a three-hour tour, a three-hour tour. The weather started getting rough. The tiny ship was tossed, if not for the courage of the fearless crew. The minnow would be lost. The minnow would be lost. The ship set aground on the shore of this uncharted desert isle with Gilligan, the skipper too, the millionaire and his wife, the movie star, the professor and Marianne, here on Gilligan's Island. <laughs> here on Gilligan's Island, we meet four of the saddest words in the English language. If you know anything about Gilligan's Island, you know these four sad words. Shipwrecked, they were shipwrecked, but never rescued. How do you like that? Shipwrecked, but never rescued. How is your Gilligan's Isle trivia? Well, let's start on the upper left and kind of work our way clockwise. Who's this gentleman in the upper left? Anybody remember? Thurston Howell the Third, right? Yeah, he's the millionaire. And anyone know his wife's name? Anybody remember that? Lovey. Lo I had to look that one up. I forgot. So, so there's Thurston Howell the Third, Lovey, and then the redhead. What's her name? Ginger, Ginger, played by Tina Louise, right? And then, of course, who do we have next to Tina Louise? Ginger. The skipper, skipper, and right next to the skipper to his left would be who? Marianne. And then, of course, kind of in the bottom, in the middle, there's a star. Who's that? Gilligan. And then to Gilligan's right would be the professor, professor. So there they are, right? Here are some more Gilligan's Island fun facts. The show ran from 1964 to 1967. Uh, just three years. It, it seemed to me like it was on for like 80 years, but just three years. I know they were syndicated, these shows were, and, and they just keep on going. The, the first year, though, you may recall, if you're a true believer, you remember the first year was in black and white, right? There were 96 episodes in all, and I have seen all 96 at least four times. <laughs> Sherwood Schwartz was the producer. Of course, Gilligan was played by who? Anybody remember? No one remembers. Right. Linda Chapman remembers. Who's that? Oh, Chuck Chapman. Yes, that's right. Okay. And who played the skipper? Oh, see, he got the junior part. That's right. It is Alan Hale Jr. Yes, yes. Chuck Chapman filled with all kinds of good, fun trivia facts, right? Of course, what I'm saying is the most important takeaway for our purposes when it comes to Gilligan's Island is, would be these four words, right? Shipwrecked, they were shipwrecked, but what? Never rescued. In all 96 episodes, they never got off Gilligan's Island. We are in our sixth week here on our summer sermon series on the Old Testament book of Numbers. Numbers, 36 chapters in Numbers. We're not taking, of course, all 36 chapters, but we are looking at some of the highlights. And today we actually look at one of the lowlights in the chapter, and that would be chapter 14. 
Let me give you a little background of chapter 14 as we develop this theme, Shipwrecked But Never Rescued. You remember, if you were here last week, in chapter 13 of Numbers, remember Moses sent out 12 men, so we had the Roman numeral 10, and then 2, so 12 men went to spy on Canaan, and 10 were what? 10 were bad, remember that, and 2 were good. Uh, what did they see when they went to Canaan? Ten were bad and two were good. Some saw giants big and tall. Some saw grapes from clusters fall. Some saw the Lord in it all. Uh, ten were bad and two were what? Good. So, so that's what happens in Numbers chapter 13. And when we get to Numbers chapter 14, we see that the congregation, the people of Israel, did they believe in the, the two good guys? No, they believe the evil report of the ten bad guys. And so that lack of faith in God's promises is going to get them shipwrecked and never rescued. That's where we pick it up to get our bearings in Numbers chapter 14, verse 11. The Lord said to Moses, how long will this people... Now, now note the phrase, this people. This is huge uh, because already in Exodus chapter 6, verse 7, God calls them my people. So most of the time in the Old Testament, if God calls them this people, that's not good. That's like my mother calling me Robert Reed. That's not good. I'm in trouble. When God calls them this people and not my people, he is saying that the relationship is done. Whoa. Why is that? Well, they despise me, God says. How long will they not have faith in me in spite of all the signs I've done among them? Well, you know the miraculous signs, right? The ten plagues in Egypt, the pillar of fire by night, the pillar of cloud by day, the thunder and lightning at Mount Sinai, all of that. And this people, not my people, this people will not have faith in me. That's a one-way ticket to being shipwrecked, but never rescued. You know the story. This group of people, the this people, end up in the wilderness for 40 years. They never make it to the promised land, right? They're never rescued. They never make it to the land of milk and honey. Why? What I accent here on the slide and in your message notes, they don't have faith. Faith. Oh, without faith, we're, we're permanently on Gilligan's Island, and we're permanently living with a bunch of Gilligans. <laughs> Ralph Waldo Emerson provides a very helpful definition of what faith is. We live by faith or we do not live at all. Isn't that interesting? If we don't have faith, then, then really we're, we're dead. <laughs> there's, there's nothing actually happening in life. He goes on, either we venture or we vegetate. <laughs> if we venture, we do so by faith simply because we cannot see or know the end of anything at its beginning. We risk marriage or we stay single. We prepare for a profession by faith or we give up before we start. By faith, we move mountains of opposition or we are stopped by mole hills. The Israelites, believing the report of the ten bad spies, are stopped by mole hills. What's it like to not have faith? Oh, what's it like to be stopped by mole hills? What's it like to be <laughs> shipwrecked but never rescued? Well, the first four verses of Numbers 14 tell us. Then the whole community began weeping aloud. They cried all night. Their voices rose in a great chorus of protest against Moses and Aaron. 
They don't believe. They don't believe God is going to take them to the land flowing with milk and honey. So then they say, if only we had died in Egypt or even here in the wilderness. They complain. Why is the Lord taking us to this country only to have us die in battle? Our wives, our little ones will be carried off as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to return to Egypt? And they plotted among themselves. Let's choose a new leader and go back to Egypt. Now look at the words that I've highlighted because these are the words that define us when we don't have faith. Weep, can't sleep at night, cry all night. Uh, we protest, complain. It's all going to go off, carried away as plunder, and, and then plot, plot. These are a happy group of people, aren't they? <laughs> Let's go have lunch with them. Weep, cry, cry out, protest, complain. We're going to die, carried off, and we plot. Someone once called this religion without a relationship. A very important idea. See, these people had religion, all right? Uh, uh, look, the, you know, they're talking about Moses and Aaron. Why is the Lord taking us? Uh, they had religion. They just didn't have a relationship. Uh, they had what we'd call churchianity. <laughs> they didn't have Christianity. Uh, they had all of the motion. They just had no emotion. <laughs> they had it all in their head. They didn't have it in their heart. It was all external. There was nothing internal about their relationship with the Lord. Stephen actually helps us out. Stephen is the first martyr. After he preached this sermon in Acts 7, he's killed. He's addressing the Jewish Sanhedrin, uh, the, the council, the, the ruling 70 elders in Israel, uh, right after the resurrection of Jesus. And, and he uses a word here in Acts 7, 38, which is very important for us. Stephen says, Moses was in the church in the wilderness, with the angel who spoke to him at Mount Sinai and with our fathers. He received living oracles to give to us. Notice that Stephen calls these people, uh, these people who don't have any faith, uh, the people who are shipwrecked, never rescued, he calls them what? The church. The church. I thought the church was a place of safety and salvation. I thought the church was a place where, where, where people are spiritually alive. I thought the church was a place where, where you go and you, you get connected to God. Yes, but there's something else that goes on in churches, and you know it, and I know it, and let me call it out. It's called churchianity. It's not Christianity. It's people who are just going through the motions. Uh, they have no emotion. It's people who have religion, not relationship. It happens in the church. See, worldly unbelief, you can spot on a dime. Church unbelief is much more insidious because you can't see it. Because people show up, and it looks as though they believe, but they really don't. Uh, someone once called this unbelieving Christianity. Uh, that's oxymoronic, right? Unbelieving Christianity? It sounds like Purdue football, <laughs> right? Short sermon, government efficiency, jumbo shrimp. What do you mean? unbelieving Christianity. Oh, I mean this. The church in the wilderness would be the people who are weeping and complaining and plotting and have no faith. Jesus warns about this, doesn't he? 
Oh, one example in Matthew chapter 7, verse 22 and 23. On the last day, very sobering verses, uh, Jesus says, many will come to me and say, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Lord, did we not cast out demons in your name? Lord, did we not do great miracles in your name? And what does Jesus say in Matthew 7, 23? I never knew you. Uh, you, you had the religion and the ritual. You just had no relationship. You had churchianity. You didn't have Christianity. <laughs> you had it all in your head, nothing in your heart. Jesus also warns a church in Revelation chapter 3, verse 1. The church in Sardis, again, hard words. You have the reputation of being alive, but you're dead. You're just going through the motions. It's just a ritual. This is why church unbelief is so insidious. And it's so deadly because you can show up and be in the church and have no real faith. Look at these people in Numbers 14, verse 3. Why is the Lord, of course, L-O-R-D in all caps, behind that is this Hebrew word Yahweh, right? He's, he's got a name, Yahweh, taking us to this land only to have us die in battle. Isn't this interesting? These unbelievers, the church in the wilderness, they, they know the covenant name of God. They know his name is Yahweh. Uh, they know all the right rituals and regulations and rules and religion. They call him by name. They just don't believe any of it. You would think that these people who are not atheists, they're not even polytheists. Polytheists, you know, believe in many gods. They'll become polytheists <laughs> in Numbers chapter 25. They really will. But we're in Numbers chapter 14. They're not atheists. They're not polytheists. They, they actually use the name of Yahweh in their worship, in their prayer. It's on their mouth, but it's not in their heart. It's called a fake faith. It looks like faith. It sounds like faith. It, it, it might smell like faith, but it's really not faith. It's fake, just like this stuff up on the screen, right? You know where all this stuff is produced? Just take a guess. China. China cost the world economy $20 billion a year because of fake merchandise. Now, you and I, if we're shopping at Walmart or Kmart or Walgreens, uh, we come across this stuff and we say, you know, this just isn't the real stuff, right? We want Nike. We want Windows. We don't want Coolgate. <laughs> we want Colgate. We can spot this. But others in the world can't. And so they buy this stuff up, thinking they're getting Nike, Colgate, Windows, and they're really getting bimbos. <laughs> this is easy to spot. Fake faith? Not so easy. How do I know? If, if anyone in the church is going to be tempted to go through the motion without the emotion, to go through the ritual without the relationship, to have the external and not the internal, who's the one person who is tempted to do that the most? The pastor. Oh, yeah. Uh, there was a church leader called Chrysostom. And he said this famously, the path to hell is paved with pastor's skulls. 
Why is that? Because pastors can just get up and do what they're supposed to do, say what they're supposed to say, pray what they're supposed to pray, but really not believe it. It would be surprising and shocking if we began to understand the numbers of people who sit in churches all their lives never once wondering if they're part of this church in the wilderness. Uh, the, the church in you know, not Christian, they're just getting religion, there's no relationship. Uh, they just sit there all their lives thinking they have the real thing, but it's a fake, it's a fraud, it's not alive. Uh, they say, well, well, I attend, and I go, and I've been baptized. I, I attend Holy Communion. I do all this stuff. But, but at the depth, it's just in their head, not in their heart. Shipwrecked, but never rescued. Well, That's not the end of the sermon. Thank God for that. (laughs) Shipwrecked, but rescued. (laughs) See, there are two people in this church in the wilderness, to use Stephen's phrase in Acts chapter 7. There are two people. Remember, uh, ten were bad, but two, two were what? Good. And they believed. They just dared to believe that what God said was actually real and true. And and here it is in Numbers 14.30. Not one shall come into the land where I swore that I would make you dwell. They're shipwrecked. They're never rescued, right? Except, here they are, the two good spies. Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, the son of Nun. They finally made it, didn't they? Caleb and Joshua to the promised land. Why? They had a real faith, a living faith, a vibrant faith. While the rest of the congregation had the reputation of being alive, but they were dead, these two men, they were spiritually alive. They had faith, faith. What's faith? I think a good picture of faith would be this bridge here. Now, I'm scared to death of heights. Many of you know that. This is why I live in Indiana. I don't live in Colorado. I used to live in Colorado. I got scared of heights. I moved to Indiana. (laughs) So assume that you're on a hike with some friends, and and to, of course, cross this valley, you have to cross it on this bridge. And if you're anything like me, you would just be scared to death. And you'd start because, you know, you understand the only way across is this rickety, old-looking, swaying-in-the-wind bridge. And very gingerly and fearfully, you take one step after the next. (laughs) Now, I can have a lot of faith in a really bad bridge... And I'm going to die because the bridge is going to crash and burn. Or I can have a little faith, just a little faith in a really good bridge, and that bridge will get me across the other side. So faith is only as good as the object of faith. Everybody with me on that? Big idea. (laughs) Your faith, my faith, is only as good as the object of faith. Well, what's our object of faith? Sometimes I hear people, you hear them too, is, is they have faith in faith. No, no, no. We're not talking about that. They have faith in themselves. They have faith in the system. They have faith in their finances. No, 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 no. Faith is only as good as the object of faith. And there's only one object of faith (laughs) that gets you across to the other side. And you know who that is. You can count on Jesus. 
every day, every hour, every year for the rest of your life. Jesus is the Christian's object of faith. And so I can have just a a little faith in Jesus, but he'll still take me where I need to go. Why is that? Jesus took the thorns. You know that. Jesus took the ridicule and the, the whips. Jesus took the nails and the spear. Jesus took the darkness. But beyond all of that, Jesus took your shame and your pain and and your dashed hopes and your guilt. The Bible says that Jesus takes away the sin of the world. Here is our object of faith. Here is how we live. In Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who loved us and gave himself up for us. So we're back to Gilligan's Island. Do you remember the episode when they had almost gotten off the island? Do you remember that one time when they were so close they, they were just inches from rescue and delivery, and then Gilligan blew it again. Do you remember that episode? Wait a minute. That was every episode. <laughs> every episode, the castaways got so close, but in all 96 episodes, they were shipwrecked, but never rescued here on Gilligan's Island. Don't let that happen to you. There's no reason to let that happen to you. Uh, These four sad words, shipwrecked but never rescued, we can replace those (laughs) with four of the most awesome words in the English language. And what would those be? Here they are. Shipwrecked, yes, we get that. (laughs) Shipwrecked, rescued by Jesus. Let's stand and confess that and sing that out with great joy.